Y'all ready for word? Now I need, I need, I need. I, well, actually, I came with my own amen. Y'all, if y'all want to join my amen, I'll be glad. to. But I, we got a word. I feel like God has a word for us today. And uh, we're just going to dive right in. So is anybody out there like me who's a just-in-case kind of person? I don't know if there's anybody like, just in case. Is there, are, are y'all like me? I'm a just in case kind of person. Like, I'm always going to have a backup coat or sweater somewhere in my coat, just in case. Is anybody else like that? Like, I'm not going to be caught out here. Caught. I hate to be cold. I'm going to have a coat just in case. Or like shoes. Women, this is for us. You wear high heels to an event. You know they, get, they got a time limit on them shoes. So just in case you got your flip-flops in your bag or in your car, just in case, I'm not going to be out here struggling, right? Or um, I'm, a, I'm a lip balm person. Like, I have several lip balms in several places just in case because my, I, I will turn into, like, a, a, a fiend. Like, I need, like, lip balm. I have one in my car, one in my bag, one in my backpack, one at work. Is anybody else like me just in case? All right, all right. What about snacks? Do we have any people who carry snacks with them? And okay, I see Deacon McBride got his snacks on deck. Some of y'all, you look in that purse and that backpack, you always gonna have a little something just in case. Just in case you get caught out there when you're hungry, you already got a snack and you don't gotta buy nothing. Uh, these, this is the next level, chargers. Anyone already got a charger? That's only the expert level. This is not for all of us. Some people who are on the expert level have a charger at all stations just in case. We're not going to be caught unawares in these streets. So these are the people we, we uh, I don't know how y'all, all the other of y'all live all willy-nilly out here and you just, you just could fly off the seat of your pants and just live. I need some back. Up. I need a backup plan. I need something just in case. Are people like me? Are you out there in the chat? Are you like me? Okay, good. I'm not alone. Well, today we are going to be talking about how to develop a spiritual contingency plan. Somebody say a spiritual contingency plan. There it is. I can't hear you in the chat. Say spiritual contingency plan. Thank you. They said it for you in the audience. A contingency plan. You know, this is a definition that we usually see in the business models, right? This is what business people, business owners, we have any business owners out there, people who are in business or, you know, these, a contingency plan is a plan devised for an outcome other than the usual expected plan, all right? That's, that's, a, that's a contingency plan. So in businesses, say that you're running a conference. If you're running a conference, you're going to make sure that you have a backup speaker just in case your speaker can't make it, right? Just in case they get sick, just in case they, you know, the plane is delayed. You got backups. Or, you know, a caterer. Like, in case the caterer goes, I got a backup caterer. I got three people, three stores on deck. I already got it all figured out. Or, you know, um, in case of extreme weather, we've already put in the clause. You, you might not be getting your money back because we've already put it in the clause. That this, These are all contingency plans. I even heard that some businesses won't fly all of their executives on the same plane. So if all the executives, if, if your, your main board and everyone who runs the company is on a plane and the plane happens to go down, the whole business is in jeopardy. So some companies, they might be going to the same place, but they'll all take different planes. That's a contingency plan for you. All right, and we also have, we have our own personal contingency plans. We have uh, life insurance. If y'all got saints, we need life insurance. Make sure we get in our life insurance. Um, we have uh, things like emergency savings. Everybody got a rainy day savings that you always need because that car want to act up when, the, when you least expect it. We got rainy day funds. We have things like these. These are all contingency plans. We know about these things, backup plans, things that we fall back, a fallback plan. Now, I want to talk today how we could use these same concepts in our spiritual life. Amen? The same concept in our spiritual life. Now, before we go into it, I just want to review last Sunday. Last Sunday, we talked about 
what to do before you let go. Do y'all remember that? What to do before you let go of hope. What, what to do when you're at the end of your rope before you let go, right? And we learned that God doesn't want us to live in fear of scarcity, amen? God doesn't want us to live in a fear like that, that there's no hope and that there's no alternative but death. Um, we learned that you may not have the finished product, but you have the ingredients for a miracle inside of you, amen? And then we learned how to do kingdom math, praise the Lord, kingdom math, and how you can bring God your little, and God will multiply your little. That's kingdom math. How you might not know how to do common core, but you can do kingdom math in the name of Jesus. And so we, so all this thing, we remember we learned about the widow. She only had a little flour and a little oil, but God took that little and multiplied it. They never ran out. That oil never ran out. That flour never ran out. Her and her boy were saved. They got to eat in a famine, and that should be it. And we should be able to say, and they lived happily ever after the end. That's what, it, after that miracle, that should have been like, and stop, full stop, right? Um, and we are going to see that in spite of what Disney tells us, there are really no fairy tale endings in life. Amen. I think we got spoiled by Disney, and we thought that everything is supposed to end on a, do you know there's really no fairy tales in life? Even when you get the thing that you really want and pray for, that thing still needs maintenance. You pray for the, the, the job, and guess what? Now you got to meet the quotas. Now you wanted a companion, and Lord, you got them, but now you got to work on the relationship every single day of your life. My God. You wanted a child and the kids, but God, you got to raise them kids. You wanted the house. Now you got to keep it clean. You want the car, you got to put the oil in it. It's always some type of maintenance that goes with the thing that you asked for. Can I get an amen? amen? So I invited you all to read the last part of chapter 17 uh, in, in, Kings chap in 1 Kings 17. I asked you to read the last chapter. So this is a pop quiz. I'm coming for, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. In the, in I, when, did y'all read? Mm-hmm. Did y'all read? No, y'all didn't read. Look at you. I did, I'm doing a pop quiz. Take out your pens and pencils. We're writing a three-page paper right now on the end of chapter 17. No, just kidding. I know the saints. I know the saints. Y'all did. Now, that's all. We're going to all review together. Amen. Somebody say, thank God for grace. Yeah, because y'all didn't read. All right. It's all good. It's all good. We're going to read together. Uh, let's all turn to 1 Kings 17, and we're going to start at verse 17. And this is the end of the, of the fairy tale, what should have been the end of the fairy tale, right? After they got the flower, after they got to eat, after everything was great, God did the miracle. It says in verse 17, after this, someone say after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. My God, sounds like what we're going through these days, right? Verse 18, and she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? Have you come to bring my sin to your to remembrance and to cause the death of my son? Come on, sit with this for a minute. God did this wonderful thing. It was supposed to be her fairy tale. And then she comes and her, her son dies? I have a question. What is your reaction when life doesn't go as planned? What is your reaction when things don't go as planned? Now, they should have just ran off into the sunset and just enjoyed their little cakes and flour and bread. But what do you do when things don't go as planned? Have you ever had things not go as planned? You didn't see it coming. You get blindsided by life. You didn't know what, like this was not in the script. I did not ask for this. I did not write this into. This is, what is, what, what do you do? Well, this was the widow's reaction in verse 18. She said, oh, okay, God's trying to pay me back. I see what this is. Okay, okay, I see what this is. God's trying to pay me back. I knew it was all too good to be true. I knew, I knew I was just waiting for the other shoe to fall. That's what I knew. I knew God was out to get me. I knew he was going to come back and have revenge on the things I used to do when I was little. I, I knew it. 
Have anyone ever been there before? Are you just waiting for the other shoe to You can't even enjoy your blessing good because you just waiting for now. Now I wonder what's going to go wrong. Come on, am I alone? Y'all with me in the virtual room? This is where she was. She had a, a wrong view of God. Because I'm here to tell you, saints, that God's not out to get you. Did you know that? Come on, you need to tell yourself that. God's not out to get me. God's not out to get me. Now there are con natural consequences to things that you do in life. Now, if you, if, you, if you don't take care of your body all your life, and then at the end of the, your life, there's natural consequences. There are things that are just natural consequences. But God's not walking around with a lightning bolt ready to get you. Like, oh, oh, that, there, you, uh -huh, there it is. That's not God. That's not God's character. That's not God's heart for you. She had the wrong view of God. Someone say wrong view of God. A lot of us have the wrong view of God. We think God is out to get us. We think God wants revenge on the, on the stuff we used to do. Come on, am I alone? Am I, am I in the right house? Okay, okay, let, let's look at, that was the widow's reaction. Let's look at Elijah's reaction. 1 Kings 17, 19 through 21. What did Elijah do? It says, and he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even on upon the widow whom I've sojourned by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. Elijah's reaction was that he was a desperate intercessor. Have you been at this place in your life before? You got hit with some bad news. You got hit that somebody is on the verge of death. You got someone, you're praying for their healing. You're praying for a relationship not to end. You're doing all the things, and you just become desperate, like, come on, God. Like, no, please don't do this. Like, they're not going to be able to take this. Like, Lord, please. Like, don't take them. Like, they're great. Like, why would you send me to this widow's house for this? Remember, you told me to find the widow. Remember the story? Would, you sent me to her. You told her, you told me that she was going to use, going to use her to provide for me. And this is what we're doing? Her son dies. God, you got to bring this child back. You can, you can imagine how he was just sweating, like, come on now, Lord. It can't go down like this. Come on, don't do this to this lady. Have you been there before? Have you been a desperate intercessor where you're like, God, I just need you. Please, you got to come through on this one. The result, 1 Kings 17, 22 to 24. This is better than a Netflix series. Y'all need to be reading your Bible. Y'all watching, y'all binging on the, uh, on the wrong things. This is better than, I just, we just did three episodes. This is a whole, this could have been a whole series. Okay, verse 22. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, 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 your, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth and that the word of the Lord is in your and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. She said, now I believe like sis, you didn't believe on, on, on the, the flower in the, in the OK, we just going to skip over. You, you didn't believe that was just like, oh, OK, that was just coincidence. She's like, no, no, now, 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 now I believe that you now you the truth now that's what she was saying now the boy came to life God heard Elijah the boy came to life God heard Elijah and the boy came to life now pause I realize that a story like this can be triggering for a lot of us who felt like we've prayed we've been desperate we've asked God and it feels like God didn't listen. 
Can we, can we have some honesty in the house? I know this could be triggering because you'd be like, oh, great for the lady, but I asked for the same thing and my person died. Or my, th- you know, my thing didn't, can we, can, we be a- can we be honest in the house? This could be really triggering because a lot of times we wrestle with the odyssey. We've talked about this before. The odyssey is trying to figure out the explanation of why a perfectly good, almighty, and all-knowing God permits evil, permits bad things to happen, permits things to happen to good people. Am I alone in this? Am I the only one that questions these things? Um, y'all in the, we good? We good? Y'all, just, y'all just love God. It don't matter, right? Okay, no. We all in the same category. We struggle with this. And I'm not going to pretend like these are things that people write whole books on. Like there's thousands and thousands of books and theories and seminaries. So I'm not just going to gloss over this like this is the answer of everything. No, these are things we wrestle with. I just want to bring up these things. Like we can't just, this guy can't just do this in one sermon and we've solved all, all the world's answers, right? So we're just touching on this. We're just leaning on these things. At this point, in most people's faith, they, they either walk away from faith or there's another, there's another choice or you can lean in to the concept of the sovereignty of God. Amen. Someone say sovereignty. Into the sovereignty of God. What is the sovereignty of God? Well, in theological terms, the sovereignty of God means that God has total control of all things past, present, or future. Nothing happens out of God's knowledge and control. All things are either caused by God or allowed by God for God's own purposes and through God's perfect will and timing. God is the only absolute omnipotent ruler of the universe and is sovereign in creation, providence, and redemption. Everybody take that in. Now, here's the the definition in layperson's term, like the regular people. Basically, God is in control, and that everything that happens, it happens according to God's plan and God's intention. Y'all got that? Y'all bring that in? Now, we're going to break it down even further to black folks' term. Black folks' terminology. Basically, the sovereignty of God means mind your business. Mind your business, or even better, Stay out of grown folks' business. That's what the sovereignty of God means in black folks' terms. You know, basically, God has the authority and the power to do whatever God wants to do, whenever God wants to, however God wants to. That's what the sovereignty of God, and that's a hard pill to swallow for a lot of us. This could be the point of departure for a lot of people's faith. And can I be honest? Because um, if you, when, it, when you're operating in your humanness, we want to believe that we should have a say in everything. Amen? That we want to believe that we have a sense of control over our lives, which is all an illusion because what do you really have control over? Think about it. What do you really have control? The only thing you really have, only have control on is your reaction to situations. It's your only, that's the only thing you can control. So there's an illusion of control that we have. And, you know, we, in our humanness, we want to be the captains of our destiny. We want to be, we don't want nobody telling us what to do. God, I want to have a say. God didn't ask me. God didn't ask me what my opinion was. This is where a lot of people stray from the faith. This is where, can we talk about weighty things today? Can we talk about, can we get into the meat of the word? All right, we're leaving the milk. We're going into the meat of the word. This is where people struggle But when you choose to embrace the sovereignty of God, someone say sovereignty, the sovereignty of God. There's three things that will happen when you embrace the sovereignty of God. The first thing, it will cause us to submit to God's authority. Yes, I said the A word. The A word is authority. A lot of people, we don't like authority. We don't want nobody to tell us what to do, including God. If we were to be honest, this is where people love for Jesus to be the savior of their life. God, save me. Save me, Lord. But we don't want the Lord. He didn't want him to be the Lord of our lives. You just save me. I don't want nobody actually telling me what to do. I don't want you to be the boss of my life. I don't want you to tell me what to do. I just want you to save me. You know, just leave me alone. Save me. Don't let me go to hell and leave me alone. 
But unfortunately, that's not how salvation works. We have the example of Job. Job, when if you read the book of Job, Job went through. He was trying to figure out, God, why? Why would you do this to me? Why would you take my family? Why would you take, I didn't do nothing to you. I'm out here just trying, God, I want answers. Like, God, Job got real bold. Like, no, God, you going to answer me, right? And then God just started hitting him with, where were you questions? He just hit him like, okay, okay, Job, since you know so much, where were you when I established the earth? Like, hey, hey, Job, do you know where the snow comes from? Hey, do you, hey, Job, 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 uh, since you know so much, do you know uh, how, how do you control animals? How do you, how do you do that? How do you even control animals you ain't never seen before? Hey, you know where light comes from? Do you know where I store rain? He just kept hitting them. You should read the end. He was just hitting them up. To at the end of it, Job was like, you know what? I spoke of things that I did not know about, and I, you know what? These are things too wonderful for me, and I'm just going to go ahead and repent. Because we get into this thing, like, we want all the answers, but this is what makes us submit to God's authority. When we really know who God is, that God controls galaxies and universes and holds the earth in his hands, and for him to do all these things and still be concerned about my life, if God can do all that, if he could hold all this universe, you telling me he can't hold your life? Come on, this is the God we serve. It will cause us, when we lean into the sovereignty of God, we will submit to God's authority. That God is the one who is ultimately in control. Two, when we submit and embrace to the sovereignty of God, it provides us comfort. Now listen to me, saints. This will give us comfort when you look at it through the lens of your life. Look over your life in every hard time, everything that was unfair, everything you went through, it will give you a sense of comfort to know that nothing went through to your life that didn't pass the filter of God's love and grace. Now, I know that's a hard pill to swallow for some of us, but you want you to know if God allows you to live through it, and if God brought you through it, God has a purpose for it in your life. And God will use that thing to help someone else in their human condition. You know, we're all in our, this human condition. We're all living in brokenness. We're all living in this earth that is full of brokenness. But perhaps God's using your story to help somebody else. The comfort that you receive, God's going to use you to give somebody else. This gives us a sense of comfort. And it changes our view of God that God's not out to get me. But perhaps everything that happened to me Pass through the filter of God's loving arms, God's loving knowledge that God allowed things to happen, not to harm me, but to use it according to God's plan. Third thing, it will inspire us to worship. When we lean into the sovereignty of God, I hope y'all getting this. When you lean into the sovereignty of God, it will inspire you to worship God. Come on, when you know that God is ultimately in control, even over the crazy things in your life, this is where you begin to worship God. This is begin where you begin to know that God is faithful, that God is loving, that God is good, and God is true. You know you can only develop your worship opinion of God through times of testing. Do you know that? So we, we, don't, want, we don't want that part of, the, of, this, of this whole situation, but... You have to test out things. You have to experiment with things to know that they work. Any science people in the building or over, I got Helen, she's a science, I got some science people. If you're in science and online, if you're in the science field, you can't just guess things, right? You have to experiment. You have to put some things together. You got to make sure it works. You got to try this and try that to get an expected result. We understand that in, the, in our everyday lives, but in the spirit, you have to try God to see if God's, how do you know that God is a provider if you never had lack? How do you know that God is a healer if you never needed anything healed? How do you know that God will always take care of you and be right there with you if you've never experienced loneliness? You have to taste and see that the Lord is good. You have to taste it. You have to get in there. There's no test. There's no testimony without a test, amen? You have to go through some things, some things you just can't know about God in theory. You can't just know God's faithfulness in theory. You can't know God's goodness in theory. It can't be on anyone else's testimony. It can't be what your grandma told you. You got to go through that thing. 
You got to test it. You got to try it. You got to know that God is real for yourself. So the sovereignty of God, that's what inspires us to worship. So this is the, this is the meat of what I'm talking about, and we're going we're gonna to go on home. When we embrace the sovereignty of God, it gives you a different narrative of God. Amen? A different narrative that will help you get through difficulties. Once you d- embrace who God is, that's when you can develop a spiritual contingency plan. Only when you embrace the sovereignty of God. I have an example of three boys who leaned into what it means, who embodied what it means to have a spiritual contingency plan. And it's located in the book of Daniel, Daniel 3. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were in a situation. They had a, the, a crazy king who was like, when I hit this playlist, y'all better, y'all better drop down to the knee and worship me. And they was like, yeah, king, the way our, the way our religion's set up, we're not able to do that. Seems like, okay, cool. Y'all don't want to do that? It's in the fire for you. Okay, and let's see what their, what their answer is. What did they say to this king when they were threatened to be killed because they would not bow? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we were thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Verse 18 is where I can shout. But if he does not, but if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. These boys had a spiritual contingency plan that our God, I know God is more than able to do it. Come on, think about everything that you want in your life. God is more than able to do it, and he will do it. We still have faith. We believe that God is more than able. But if he does not, come on, do you have a but if he does not in your spirit? Because we get so fixed on what we want, and we're so tied and so married to our plan. But this is where we need a contingency plan. If he does not, let it be known that I won't bow to depression. I won't bow to anxiety. I won't bow. I won't give up. I won't let go. Even if he does not, let it be known that God is able and that God is good, that God is loving even if he does not. Come on, this is, this is where we get into a mature faith, that we're not just some whiny little kids running around as, as baby Christians. This is when we start growing up in our faith. So how about you? Will you trust the character of God in your life? Will you trust God's character? All you got to do is read the Bible and see the character of God. See the heart of God towards us as human beings. Will you trust God's character? Because it is Satan's main job to assassinate the character of God. He's been doing it since the very beginning. We see it in the book of Genesis when he first arrives on the scene. What's the first thing he does? Hey, yeah, hey, Eve, you know God don't really want you to be smart, right, girl? God ain't really trying to make you smart. He hold him back from you. He don't want you to be great. No, no, he don't want you to eat that fruit because, you know, if you eat that fruit, then you're going to be like him. He don't want nobody on his level. So I'm just saying. Trying to always assassinate God's character, always trying to get us to doubt who God is and what God wants to do for us. How long will we listen to the enemy? How long will we listen to a liar, the father of lies, who never say nothing that Satan says can be true. Nothing. So how long will we believe the lies of the enemy who tells us God's not for you? God forgot about you. You don't got no purpose. You you should just give up. There's no reason for you to be here. How long will we listen to the lies of the enemy? We need to trust God's character. So this is the conclusion of the matter. Y'all ready for the conclusion of the matter? I said all this to say this. So let us develop a yet praise in our spirit. 
Hallelujah. How many got a yet praise? Yet will I praise him. Come on, let's get a nevertheless in our spirit. Anybody got a God nevertheless? No matter what, God, nevertheless, I'll give you praise. Nevertheless, I'll give you glory. God, yeah, it looks bad right now, but nevertheless, I will praise you. How many people got it even though? God, even though I'm going through. God, even though it hurts. Now, I'm not saying for you to to deny. I don't want you to be overly spiritual and deny reality. No, things hurt. Your feelings get hurt. You're grieving. It touches your humanity. You get mad. You get in up. But even though, do I have some saints that will say, even though, nevertheless, yet will I? This is what I'm talking about. This is a spiritual contingency plan. Job said, He gives and takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on. We just want the give part from God. We'll shout all day over God give. God gives. God gives. We'll shout on God give. But when it goes to God gives and God takes away, it gets real quiet. Do you know that's a function of God? That God gives and God takes away. So you better have a contingency plan in place. When God takes away, everything that God gives us should be held in our hands as an open hand that God could put in any time and God could take away at any time because it all belongs to him. God gives and God takes away, but God said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on, will you bless God even when he takes away? Will you bless God even when he takes away? Will you bless God when things are difficult? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, even when things take an unexpected turn, we're going to practice. We're about to practice. Even at you listening on the, on the virtual, those who are in it, every time I say something, I want you to just begin to bless God. Whenever God does, we're going to bless God. We're moving into a higher levels of faith. We're going from glory to glory. So, this is your time. So, even when God... Even when things take an unexpected turn, will you still say God is good? Come on. God is good. Even when uh, unexpected, when things are taking longer than expected, come on, will you still give God a praise? And will you still say, God, I will trust you? When someone dies unexpectedly, will you still say, God, you're good? God, thank you for your comfort. Thank you for your peace in this time. When someone I pray for still dies, will you still say, God, you're still good? God, I trust your sovereignty. God, you're still, you're still on the throne, and you're going to help us through this time. When my life is not going as planned, God, I still trust you. God, this was not the way I saw it, but I give it to you. God, I love you. When, 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 when my timeline that I set for myself is way off, when it's way off, what do you say? God, I love you. God, I trust you. God, I give it to you. You are the sovereign God. When I'm waiting on a companion, come on, where are my single people? When you're waiting on that companion, will you still say, God, I'll trust you. God, I believe you. I believe in your timetable, God. You are the sovereign God. For those who are waiting for children, come on, for those who, will you say, God, I still trust you. My ovaries trust you, oh God that you will still do exceedingly and abundantly all that we ask or think. This is the contingency plan that we have to set in our hearts, not just to worship God when God comes through, but also when, the, when, when we got a plan for life. You know, life happens for, the, for everyone. Rain falls on the just and the unjust and the indifferent. It all happens to us. But this is why we have a living hope. Amen. This is why we don't lose hope, because our hope is a person. Hallelujah. Our hope is Jesus. Come on, can we just begin to worship Jesus? Jesus is the living hope. Jesus is the resurrection. Come on, just like in that story, that little boy died, but that is symbolic of the things that have died in our lives, that Jesus wants to resurrect, that that doesn't want, God doesn't want us to die in this hope. God wants to give us hope, and it's a living hope. It's an active hope. It all comes through Jesus. Jesus is in the business of resurrecting. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someone needs to give God a praise right there. Hallelujah. 
God, yet will I trust you. Yet will I trust you. Nevertheless, I'll trust you. I give you an even though praise. God, you're worthy of it all because you are sovereign. You're in control of it all. And you will work everything according to your will. Every broken place, every hurtful place, every unjust place. You're weaving it together like a braid. You're putting it together like a beautiful tapestry. Oh, God, your ways are higher than ours. Your thoughts are higher than ours. God, we don't know, but you know, oh, God. And this is the ultimate sign of surrender, that we would trust a God who is a spirit. God is a spirit. That means we can't see him. But our spirit cries out to his. When we come to Jesus, our spirit comes alive. And it's our spirit. That's why we are to walk by the spirit. Our spirit follows God's spirit. God is a spirit. It's not our logic. It's not our flesh. It's our spirit. So, God, put it in our spirit. Let us follow you, oh, God. Let us have a contingency plan that, God, even if you don't do it, you're able to do it. <laughs> don't get it twisted. God can do it. But even if he doesn't, I will yet serve him. I will yet trust him. I will yet hold on to a living hope. Hallelujah. So our sailor questions, these are things we want you to stop and think about. Stop and think about through the week. What is your usual reaction to the surprises of life? Think about what, how, what's your default? What, what do you usually do right when, you, when things don't, when you get blindsided? What is your usual reaction? And number two, where in your life, I don't care if it's past, present, or future, do you need to embrace the sovereignty of God? Where do you need to embrace the sovereignty of God? That God is ultimately in control of everything in your life. And if it was allowed, it was allowed for a purpose to bring God glory or to help somebody else. Number three, how can you intentionally develop a spiritual contingency plan to lean on in times of difficulties? In this way, we're not turning God into a Santa Claus in which we are giving God a list of to-dos at all time. In this way, we are giving God, we're praying to God, and when we pray to God, we want God's heart for our situations. We don't tell God anything. <laughs> we fellowship with God, and we get God's heart for, his, for how does, how God, how do you see the situation? How do you see my family members? How do you see this? And I want your heart. So, God, thank you for how you're going to bless us with a spiritual contingency plan. So let's just close in a word of prayer. God, this word is for us. God, we thank you. We worship you. We embrace your sovereignty. This is the point where people walk away from faith because it's, it's hard to surrender it's hard to surrender our plans, but God, we lay it down at your feet. This is what real Christianity is about, dying to ourselves, dying to what we want and picking up the cross and doing what you want. And God, I pray that you would change our lens of you. God, we've been seeing you the wrong way this whole time. God, we've been seeing you as a God who's trying to punish us or a God who's just trying to hold us back or doesn't care about our wants and our needs and our desires. But God, now we see that you are sovereign, that you are in control of our lives, every minute detail you care about. God, let us see you through the loving lens that you have for us, that everything in our lives went through your filter and you allow and everything that we want and desire is in your sovereign will and we submit to it now God help us when tests and trials and death and, and sickness or anything in our human condition comes into our lives 
God, will you fortify our spirits with the contingency plan that will say, yes, this hurts, but God, I still trust you. God, you're still good. God, you love me. You care about me. This is what's true of your character. And I won't listen to the enemy, but I will believe your word. I will believe who you are. God, let this be what we hold on to. Let us have a plan in place that we will trust you, we will serve you no matter what. And this isn't, this isn't us mustering up the strength. It's through your spirit. It, you are the one that gives us the strength. You give us comfort. You give us peace. It's all you. You are the living hope. It's all about you. So, God, even in this time, I'm praying for those who are watching or listening who don't know you, who have not experienced you in this way. If you want Jesus in your life, you need this peace. You need this joy. You need this hope. Will you just pray this prayer with me and just ask the Lord into your life and say, Jesus, I need you. I need this hope, this peace, this joy. I believe that you died for me, that you rose for me. And I want to make you the Lord of my life. I declare that you are Lord of my life, Lord and Savior. So just bless me as I follow you all the days of my life. Hallelujah. God, we give you this time. We pray that you would bless our church family. God, that you would con continue to mature us in our faith. Lord, that we will be able to stand strong, that we will be a light and a beacon for those who are hurting, for those who are broken, for those who are going through. Lord, let our testimony be the thing that uh, helps them overcome. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by our testimony. So, God, we trust you with our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. And thank God. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for joining us today. I pray that this word will take root into your heart, into your life, that you will meditate it on, on it this week, and that you will truly know how much God loves you. Amen. Amen. Don't forget to join us in person next week. Pastor Mike will be here live. We will be in the house. We hope to see you there. Um, don't forget to join us on Wednesday. We are on Facebook and YouTube for 6 a.m. Prayer Saints every Wednesday morning and Tuesdays on our Zoom call. So we love you. Have a great week. Go out and show people the way. <laughs>